You're listening to Let's Talk Trio on Podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in for another episode of Let's Talk Trio. A lot has happened in between since our break. Our last episode was back in December of 2018, and a lot of things have happened since. We had a government shutdown. We've had um, uh, several things going on politically that uh, we'll certainly get to talk to in future episodes. But just briefly, this government shutdown uh, for four weeks um, over a proposed border wall has, uh, of course, effectively uh, froze a lot of people out of their paychecks. Uh, Thankfully, the government is now funded for at least another week and a half before this this conversation gets tabled again. Um, And as an outsider kind of looking in and the while the uh, the freeze didn't directly impact me, I can tell you that scrolling through various stories of people who've been directly impacted by the the shutdown and what it means to them uh, did definitely uh, tug at my heartstrings. Um, And then I was also very concerned about our trio programs to see uh, how they would be impacted. Fortunately, the trio program stood and they were not impacted directly by the government shutdown. I think had it lasted longer, then we might have seen a ripple effect into the the educational trio programs. Uh, Fortunately, that did not come to pass. Uh, I think we we were looking at a quarter of the government that was shut down and uh, needed funding in order for it to continue. We were looking at um, various aspects of the government that immediately impacted low-income individuals. Now, again, I don't mean to make this episode political, but uh, the president's actions to um, withhold government funding and to um, force the majority of the house uh, Mitch McConnell essentially hostage and uh, telling him you cannot open the government unless we get this border wall funding um, certainly uh, uh, created a lot of chaos Um, in the world of entertainment you we've seen the that the New England Patriots have won their sixth Super Bowl ring Uh, My hometown, Los Angeles, uh, the Los Angeles Rams, who have recently moved from St. Louis, uh, lost in the Super Bowl in a very, very paltry score, a 13-3, which, um, full disclosure, I'm a full-fledged Carolina Panther fan um, and have been thinking about uh, going back to Los Angeles. But uh, since uh, the L.A. Rams, um, this this was just an embarrassing opener and an embarrassing way to start the Super Bowl, but... Uh, for me, the, La- the Rams will continue to be uh, my backup team, uh, but I will uh, will gladly now go back to 100, 120% supporting the Panthers for the upcoming season. So again, a lot of things happening between our break since uh, we last spoke. Um, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, if you don't know what the doomed Doomsday Clock is, was well, something started there back in the 1940s. Uh, I was cle- keeping a very close eye on this. Uh, and to find out that we are again still two minutes from midnight Uh, again if you want to do a little bit of research i'll include the link in the podcast but uh, various things uh, again happening in the time that we took a break Um, the break was much needed Uh, there were a lot of uh, interviews that we're following up on Uh, i just wanted to send a quick shout out to my crew Uh, john russell uh, always providing the best tech and uh, always recommending the best microphones to use for each of our uh, of the events that we attend. So, John Russell, thank you so much for everything that you do. And also to my producer, Amelia Castaneda, who is out there as, as well, hunting down leads and finding finding ways where we can be involved as a podcast. And uh, we've, we've not been forgotten. Uh, I'm very excited to also uh, announce that we will be participating in the Trio Day in Denver, Colorado, uh, which is coming up on the 22nd. We are excited to be part of it, and uh, we'll be broadcasting there at Capitol Hill. Um, And this is is just an exciting opportunity for us to get to know directly from the students how TRIO has impacted them. So we're very excited to be part of that event. Um, There are going to be a lot of TRIO events happening in Fort Collins as well, so the podcast will be ready uh, to record those stories and, and to bring those live to you. So again, a lot of things, a lot of things have happened 
since we last took since we took our break back in December, at the very end of December, uh, with the government shutdown, entertainment just uh, going all over the place. And um, if you have not done so, and do yourself the favor, um, watch Spider Man into the Spider Verse. I'm probably super late into this, and I should have uh, vocalized it uh, at one of my final podcasts, but. Uh, if you've not seen that um, mo- beautiful movie, uh, it's wonderfully written and it has a wonderful uh, voice acting cast. Uh, you should do yourself a favor and watch the movie. It, it's magnificent. I'm a huge Spider-Man fan, fan, by the way, and this one is definitely in my top three. I cannot be biased. I'll say top three uh, to uh, to this movie. So again, lots of things happening in between our break, in between the break, and now catching up to all the events happening around the world we are very fortunate to be where we're at as far as a a podcast and talking directly to students and bringing you these stories to you as we promised at the very beginning of the year we said uh, new stories new people uh, same podcast Um, we are getting interviews left and right we are collaborating with others to bring you these stories not just for the sake of bringing you stories, but for the meaningful uh, connection that can happen uh, when, a sto- when a student shares that story. And the story that you're about to hear uh, is no exception. So my guest today is Kayla Tejada, who is a graduate of the University of Massachusetts in Lowell. She has a great trio story to tell. And uh, funny enough, the way this even started how we even connected was um, I saw that she was uh, being a guest speaker for an event and it said trio on it and I couldn't put two and two together I, I looked at Kayla and I was like I didn't know you were trio and she confirmed she's like yeah I was part of the talent search program and I was like oh my gosh I need to sit down in an interview like this person works literally down the hallway from me at Colorado State University and I never knew she was trio. So we ended up talking, uh, discussing, and then I uh, offered her to be um, a guest on the podcast. And she jumped out to the opportunity. She really wanted to get her story out there and really advocate for trio students. Uh, so it was funny uh, getting to, to know Kayla uh, in that manner. First, uh, as first she, I knew as, as a colleague, didn't really know that she was a trio participant at all. And then she opened up and revealed, yep, I'm a trio student. Um, trio alum and uh, that's how we were able to get to talking so the upcoming story what you're about to hear next is her journey through through the talent search trio program and her decision to go to college so um, I hope that you sit back and relax and enjoy the program Um, a quick shout out to the Council of Opportunity and Education who has now officially included us in the newsletter for future who it, who have included us uh, as an unofficial podcast for the for the for the organization? Um, we're going to continue partnering and figuring out ways to bring the podcast to others. Uh, but this is a, a great step in the right direction. A partnership with COE has certainly elevated our status. We have now more listeners than we did uh, back in November. Uh, we are numbering in the about 500, 600s of the audience members so well thank you all so much for listening uh we're very very happy and very fortunate to continue doing what we're doing uh and your support uh that continues to help build us so uh plan on uh continuing to support us uh again we're not asking for financial contribution all we're asking is that you share this episode with all your friends have them download the episode from the podbean app or uh, if you share it on facebook Make sure that they are downloading and hearing the episode uh, right there. That really helps our streaming. That really helps um, boost up our numbers. And I think it brings attention to the episodes. Uh, The more we can hit outside of the trio community, the more people will be aware of the trio community as well. So uh, while, again, this is directly targeted for trio, trio staff, trio students, uh, we'd like to also hit outside the bubble as well for people that may not know what trio is. And this is a very good podcast to uh, get a jumping on point to get to know students and get to know the staff that run these magnificent programs. So Kayla's interview is coming up. I just want to say again, say thank you to the to the audience. Thank you very much for all your support. February is going to be a super busy month for us. You're going to hear 
a ton of stories. You're going to uh, listen to us cover a lot of events. Uh, March is going to be just as busy. Um, and then uh, we're looking at a schedule of uh, February, March, April, with May uh, maybe slowing down just a little bit and maybe us taking a break um, in July, maybe for the first two weeks of July and then right back at it. But uh, this podcast is re- re- uh, it's getting that uh, recognition that it needs to push forward. And uh, the more you share, the more you see it on social media, uh, and the more you push it out there to other, for other people to listen to, uh, really brings um, much more needed attention to this podcast. And it does wonders and it does great things for us when people uh, share the, the episodes. Again, thank you so much, and uh, again, uh, please sit back, enjoy, and listen to the interview. I'll see you at the end. You're listening to Let's Talk Trio on podcast. Today's guest is Kayla Tejada, who I have here, graduate of the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, your degree is in psychology and, and, gender studies. and gender studies. That's amazing. And you are also a TRIO alum of the mm-hmm. Talent Search program. Yes. Uh, and we're going to get to hear your experiences here in just a bit. Uh, but can you give the audience a, a more thorough introduction of yourself? Yeah. So, name's Kayla. I have been in Colorado now for about three years. I got my master's degree from here in student affairs and higher ed, but prior to coming here, and I guess my story that informs TRIO and my involvement a little bit more, is I grew up in Massachusetts about 30 minutes outside of Boston in Lowell, Massachusetts. I think it might be the third biggest city in Mm -hmm. Massachusetts, so fairly, it's not like a small town. Um, And I grew up, my mom and my dad, they had me when they were 18 and 19, so my mom turned 18 and had me a couple weeks later um both of them didn't have much support or money right we didn't grow up with a lot of money and so when they got pregnant with me they knew that they needed to work to be able to afford to take care of me so they both dropped out of high school so they have their GEDs now but you know growing up they didn't have a high school degree um they broke up when I was, you know, maybe two years old. They were never married. And I um, was in Lowell. I went to my middle school there. I went to my high school there. And I tried to go to a private college my first year um, of school and <laughs> learned very quickly that not that um, it was not the place for me, but it was expensive, too expensive for me. And in terms of like diversity and feeling as though. I could see representation of myself was Mm -hmm. not really a thing because they were a small private college, predominantly white, um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a place that has a lot of money. I mean, Harvard is right there. We like neighbors (laughs) to Harvard. Um, An interesting experience. I got very involved there. I love it. I don't regret it, but very expensive. And so when I found out how expensive it was and what that would mean if I stayed there for four years and accumulated that debt, I transferred back home to the University of Massachusetts Lowell and then yeah finished my degree there in psychology and gender studies but I think um, the importance of TRIO and what that had on my life and even now comes back to my upbringing the culture um, identities lack of access Mm -hmm. to a lot of things Mm -hmm. um, and not having money and not having people around me that had ever been through what I was actually before tree I didn't even know existed like I didn't really understand college or how to apply to college or that that was an option for me right so um those things all impacted how I showed up I was the first in my family to graduate from high school with a high school diploma yeah Yeah. so um for so really first first generation in many ways yeah yeah exactly and so even today I kind of like I laugh because I'm like holy cow like I would have, if you would have, you know, approached me in high school first year and said, like, oh, what's a master's degree? Are you going to get one? I probably would have been like, I don't know what a master's degree is. Like, what are you talking about? Right. Um, what's a PhD? What is graduate school? Is that the same thing as undergrad? I mean, even to this day, like, I joke with my mom because when I was in getting my master's, she was like, what are you getting your undergraduate 
in again. And I'm like, Mom, I'm getting my master's degree now. Like, I already got my undergraduate, right? But it's just not having people around you that have been through that, a lot of confusion with language. And so um, I look now and I'm really thankful for how far I've come. And I know a lot of those seeds that were planted started with TRIO very early on. Awesome. And I can't thank you enough for being part of this podcast yeah. because this was a unique opportunity, uh, not only for me, but finding out that you were a trio student <laughs> blew my mind. I was like, never th in a million years I thought that someone working down the hallway from me was also a trio student. So yeah. uh, when I found that out, I was like, wow, I got to interview Kayla. We don't brag enough about no. being involved in trio. No, no. It's, it's usually <laughs> under wraps or I find yeah. out like way later about uh -huh. other people working in or uh, being part of trio. So you were part of the trio talent search program. Mm -hmm. Um Tell me a little bit about that experience and how that was. Yeah, super. I feel like I'm not old, like that old, right? And I feel like so long ago trying to like look back and reflect. I remember the first time that they like reached out because I never like applied to or knew about it and like actively made the decision to get involved. I was told like, hey, this is an option for you. And I think even when it was in um, like late middle school, and then they followed us into high school too. Oh wow! Okay. Um, yeah. I didn't know what they were talking about. I was like, "What is this trio? This is something that I got placed into." Later, I found out that they placed me into it because of like my risk in terms of like my family not having high school diplomas or college degrees, and that's my mom might have did an application, didn't know exactly what she was filling out at the time. Um, but I remember, you know, have like going to these like sessions and talking a little bit, a little bit about um, college and being like, hmm, new concept, what is this? And you know, the program at my high school was really great about taking us on field trips, mm -hmm. field trips yeah. to different universities and colleges in the Massachusetts area, and that was like life changing for me because I had never been on a college campus mm -hmm. you know some people have like cousins or oh, brothers sure. right sure. they get to see it and they're like wow this is so cool like you can live here you can right. also study here like this is great I never had that my first experience of all of those things were on field trips with TRIO mm -hmm. um, and you know they never like had us pay or anything so there's no barriers or limit to like access to be able to see that I remember just getting like really excited to hear from like different people who worked on campus and the programs they have and see different facilities where like research was going on um, and then like eating on campus too right because that's when you're in high school it's like oh, oh what we're getting lunch here too and they have a whole dining yeah. hall yeah. so I think at, at that point in time when I was involved in those ways I didn't I don't know if I fully conceptualized what that meant mm -hmm. I think it took me going through it and then being removed for a little bit to understand like the significant impact they were having on me in that moment because mm -hmm. um, I was like oh this is you know I'm taking a day trip you know this is a day on the weekend um, but they really helped me to realize that like college was an option for me yeah. not just you know because it's one thing to bring a bunch of kids onto a campus and like hey look at this I think it's another thing to like hey even though you don't have anyone around you that has done this this is something that you can do if you want to yeah um and so I just yeah I credit like me even feel or even knowing what college was and being able to send applications to them and obviously like there was some other pivotal people in my high school who helped that too mentors and role models but sure, sure. very much so um trio to begin with Okay. So, and as you're moving from middle school to high school, is the idea of college ingrained into your mind at this point about that you want to go, were you forming kind of a list of colleges that where you wanted to attend? Yeah, I don't think so. I think it was kind of like, I guess the best way for me to explain it is kind of like survival mode. Like what is oh, the yeah. next, yeah. what's the next step, right? And so mm -hmm. in my mind, I was like, okay, getting through this first year of high school. Okay, victory. Getting through the second year. I don't think it was until, you know, they were like, hey, applications are due and oh, yeah, scholarships. Yeah. I was like, oh, like this is the next step. I need to do this now. Um, and, you know, funny story about one oh, of yeah. the TRIO advisors. Um I remember, like, when I was like, wow, applications are due. Like, I don't have any time to waste. I need to do this. I probably, like, my end of my junior year, right? Yeah. I was trying to think of a list of schools. I didn't know where I was going to apply, what that looked like, what they entailed, what was... I didn't even know if I knew what a good fit was. I was just like, you get into a college, and 
whatever major you get accepted for, that's what it is. Yeah. And I remember the my trio um, advisor, Mr. Curry, he was saying like you should like to pick be strategic, right? Pick a couple schools that you are like you think are out of your reach, like in your mind, like they're super far out of your reach, but you would love to go there if you get accepted. Mm -hmm. Pick a few schools that are maybe a little bit like your GPA is a little bit higher than what they typically accept or, you know, so like your safety schools essentially. Right. And then maybe pick like five that you think you have a good shot of getting in. So there's like a range. Um, And I was like, okay, that makes sense. I can do that. So you do some research and look. And then he was like, you should apply to Harvard. And I was like, what? (laughs) Absolutely not. I'm not applying to Harvard. Like geniuses go to Harvard. I'm not a genius. Um, my like criteria does not meet what Harvard accepts. Like, no way. And so, actually, and it's it's funny because I talk to students I advise now about this. Mm-hmm. It's like he he told me he was like, well, if you don't apply, like, you never know if you would right. Like, what's what's hurting you about applying? And they helped me with fee waivers for college too. So yeah. I guess like, and that was a privilege I had too. I wasn't paying for all of these applications, which allowed me to be a little bit more flexible with where I was applying, where students I'm working with now, applications are a lot of money, so it's a little bit different. But I say to them too, I'm like, you know, if this is your dream school and you're, if you're already telling yourself you're not going to get in, you're already working against yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you don't know until you know. And so, you know, what does it hurt to be able to apply? Exactly. I just remember honestly, like just thinking that he was like out of his mind, <laughs> right? Like It was crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. come on, who do you think I am? Um, obviously I didn't get into Harvard, but I did apply. And I think just like the moral, the, the lesson that he taught me was that you, we don't give ourselves enough like credit Mm -hmm. and we don't have enough confidence in ourselves. Oftentimes when we're in these programs and we don't have role models around us who have been in that, we just think like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, deal with minimum. Yeah. Whatever whatever I can get, I'm going to take. And I think the lesson in that, even if I didn't get in, was you need to, like, be your biggest, like, advocate and take those chances and know that you don't just need the minimum. You can, like, shoot for the stars. And if you don't get in or accepted or whatever, that's fine. Like, there's another opportunity that will come. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes I laugh, like, yeah, I really applied to Harvard. I ended up right next to Harvard, a school sure, next to yeah, them, right? Yeah. Um, didn't go there, but I just think the the lessons in that were, you know, much more impactful than anything else. Absolutely. For sure. I think that a lot of students get intimidated by the process, the college application process, and uh, you applying to Harvard must have been just a an outside experience, uh-huh. a surreal experience. Um, can you tell us the moment you decided you were going to uh, the your other, one of your other colleges? Yeah, I, um, so what's, what's interesting too is I wasn't the best student, like, ac- like, I mean, I think I had like a, I don't know, maybe a 3.3 or something. Uh-huh. Um, I, like, self-fulfilling prophecy, I always told myself I wasn't a good test taker, so I took the SATs and, like, didn't do well. Um, I think a lot of that starts when we're younger and, you know, then we internalize it as we get older. Sure. So I didn't have, like, the best metrics or numbers when applying. And so I kind of was just, I had this mindset, like, wherever I get in, I'll go. I don't care, right? And so I actually, um, my mom wanted me to stay home. She wanted me to stay in Lowell until she was encouraging me to apply to UMass Lowell. And I was like, I don't want to stay here. I want to spread my wings and leave. Um, but I applied there anyways just to, like, make her happy. And I didn't even get in. So <laughs> I didn't even get in. I didn't even want to go there, and then I didn't sure. get in. And then that, like, was a confidence hit, like an eagle. Like, wow, I didn't even get accepted to the school that I grew up down the street from. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was, like, kind of, like, sad for me. I kind of went to college having this mindset, like, am I even good enough to be here? What is going on? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I I got accepted to some state schools. Um, I think I got accepted to, like, Salem State, LaSalle, which these are all, like, either state schools or small private schools. Mm -hmm. Um, And Leslie University, which is where I ended up that first year, I I think that I just like they had an orientation and or maybe a campus visit or something and sure. I went there and I think just the idea of knowing that I got accepted and I could see it in person just kind of like solidified it for me. Mm-hmm. I wasn't looking at uh you know the faculty there and how the faculty were or the resources there or um how are the residence halls and how's my learning environment. I didn't know 
to ask any of those questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it was kind of just like, they accepted me. This campus looks cool. Right. It's next to Boston. Sure, I'll go. Yeah. Um, and at orientation, I, I met some really cool people that I really connected with, yeah. which kind of like that just sold me to. I'm like, oh, wow, like I can see myself in these people. Yeah. Um, I think at that time, Leslie, because they didn't have any diversity, <laughs> For they're trying to better that, and they were probably accepting students that they thought were going to help diversify their campus. And I think I was one of those, to be quite honest, which is fine. Um, and then, yeah, after that first year, I applied to UMass Lowell again, mm -hmm. but transfer students, which this is a really cool thing about like having opportunities later that you might have not had to begin with, right? Transfer students, they didn't look at your SATs. And so after my first year in college at Leslie, I had like a 3.9 GPA. Mm -hmm. I was so scared to disappoint my family that I just like killed it. Like people were going out and I was like, no, 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 I need to study, I need to do well, I need to pull A's. And so they didn't look at my test scores, they just looked at my GPA and my involvement of my first year in college and accepted me as a transfer student, which I'm really thankful for now because I probably wouldn't get accepted if they looked at the SATs again. Um, and really UMass Lowell being there was like pivotal even to my success now. So. I'm thankful for second chances, really. Absolutely. So what was your support network like at uh, University of Massachusetts in Lowell? Yeah. Um, you know, during that, I was living, I lived back at home when mm -hmm. I moved back. And um, my mom, they were young when they had me. And I, we have never, we have very rarely had like a good relationship where we see eye to eye on things. Mm -hmm. And so living at home, was a was a struggle it that f some first semester back I had like a 2.8 GPA like my grades like plummeted just because there was you know, like alcohol stuff and drug stuff going on at home and we were bumping heads and I went from living on campus and having independence for a bit to not having any and there was just a lot of transition yeah and so my all of my support my support network came from people on campus so um, I had a supervisor in orientation because I became an orientation leader mm -hmm. who was pivotal I mean everyone in that office I was an admissions tour guide my supervisor there was like you know my backbone um, and I worked in the office of multicultural affairs again like all these people became my mentors and like rallied around me and I was very vulnerable and open about my story um, which I know isn't easy for everyone but I think it allowed people to know that I needed help and be able to help, mm -hmm. you know? Because if someone doesn't know you're struggling, they can't really do anything. And right. I was pretty uh, honest and open. I remember one day my mom and I had gotten into um, a fight and she kicked me out and I was like staying with a partner at that time that was not a healthy relationship at all. And my supervisor for admissions found out and the next day got me a room in the residence hall over the summer to oh, stay wow. in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah. I mean, like, these people, even to this day, I still talk to them and try to reach out, right? Not as often as I did before because life gets busy. But if it wasn't for all of them rallying around me, I, I honestly don't think I would have gotten through okay. undergrad, through UMass Lowell. Right. Um, they, like, pushed me through graduation. So they were my, I think, having those people on campus that you can look to and go to and you feel safe with and comfortable with are crucial, especially... Even if your family, if you don't have the issues that I did, mm -hmm. if your family didn't go to college, it's really hard to have those conversations. Absolutely. Like, I'm struggling with these grades. I don't know how to register for this class. My financial aid came back, and I, I don't know what this means. It's really hard to talk to your families about that. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. so having those people on campus who, are, who want to support you makes that transition easier mm -hmm. because they work in it, right? So they can help a little bit more. They have those connections. Um, so I just think that's that's such an important part to our success of being first gen and being Absolutely. on campuses. Uh, I so relate so much, and I think a lot of our listeners do, with your story about uh, starting from the beginning of just even that college application process of Ugh. where do you even begin? Like for, yeah. for me, I knew it was uh, trying to decide, well, I'll be honest, I only had one school in mind. It was my uh, Eastern New Mexico University. I didn't think I was good enough for any other school, and I was just like, I'm gonna apply. I don't even know if it's, if it's gonna happen. But just like your experience, it's that unknown and not being able to relate to my, my own parents about mm -hmm. what that college experience looks like. So was it hard 
uh, that first uh, your first four years there? It was difficult. It was really I think like I think I said this earlier, but literally just surviving. Like I was I was never able to thrive because I was just trying to survive. Like I'm just like get to the next day. Okay, we got here. Let's get to the next day. And so looking back, there's just so many things. Like Trio set me up for as much success as I possibly could. Like you can't they can't walk me through college right. too, you know? Right. They did their best to provide me with all the information and resources possible before I went to college. Um, and I think it helped with that application process, right? Because if it wasn't for them, I, I wouldn't even know what I was doing. But getting through college, then it was kind of like, okay, who, who do I have now? Yeah. Like, who do I call to now? Yeah. Um, and sometimes I get like really sad because I'm like, you know, college is expensive. Like I look back and I'm like, I don't, I think I was so stressed out so constantly. I don't even know if I remember half the things I learned because mm-hmm. I was like worried mm-hmm. about living and money and eating and all these things right um and I just think about you know the the privilege that people have when they understand how to navigate that system and they have family who gets it and they have money and they're able to enjoy college and understand it in a much different way than what we're able to um and I know that's like the reality it's still unfortunate so ways that I try to I don't know try to find hope and positivity for the future is I have siblings right and so now that I know and I've been through it, it wasn't ideal for me, I can give the insights to my siblings that I didn't have. Or if I decide to have kids, I could give those insights to my children so that they don't have the same struggle. And so I think like knowledge sharing is so crucial because like what was the point of us going through all the struggle if we're not going to be able to tell our community and the people around us how to do it better than what we did. And so they can learn from our mistakes rather than making that same mistake again. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I you know, <laughs> texting my 15-year-old sister like, hey, I mean, she's in high school. Have you thought about college? Like, what major are you thinking? Right? And just, yeah. like, even asking those questions and using that language, I think, starts to plant the seeds that Trio plants it is, because you know, she's not involved with Trio, right? So yeah. Yeah. she, like, just trying to get her to think and be in that mindset so she's prepared when she goes, a little bit more than I was. Yeah. That's really cool that you're really thinking ahead for her and applying what you've learned mm-hmm. and disseminating that information. I think that's a, yeah. that's important. Um, so, and you didn't stop at just your undergrad. <laughs> you Oops. decided that uh, it was it would be to your benefit to pursue a different degree. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh huh. Honestly, like going back to like the mentors I talked about earlier, all of them, if you notice, are all in student affairs. Oh, like okay. my admission yeah. supervisors, well, at least, yeah. you know, it changes school to school what student affairs is considered, but sure. admissions, orientation, residence life, multicultural affairs, everything that I was involved in and all the people that were rallying behind me were all in student affairs. And so, right, we're going back again to like upbringing and knowledge and access. I honestly, like I thought like I could be a teacher, I could be a police officer, I could, um, I don't know, right, the jobs they tell you in kindergarten that oh, yeah. you can do. Right. and you don't really know much outside of that unless you're exposed to it and so they got me exposed to what student affairs was and I was like huh like you all helped me so much I want to be able to help others the same way you did me and support them that way how do I do this and so right then I find out there's a master's degree and you need a master's degree to be able to pursue it after college I was undergrad I was so burnt out I was like I cannot go right through I will not make it Um, I knew that I could you know become a little bit more mature and there was other life experiences that would benefit me in grad school and so I had heard about AmeriCorps I was just kind of like Peace Corps but it's just domestic in one year instead and I applied to um, be a VISTA a volunteer in service to America and I got accepted to a program at Sacramento State University creating a um, program called Commit to Study, which I developed and implemented it, and it was for minoritized and subordinated identity students that Mm. were in STEM to help with graduation retention. Okay. So looking at like time management, uh, study habits for science majors, growth mindset, those things. And so I think that was a perfect way to breathe, take a moment, still do what I love and what I was interested in, um, and then use that time, you know, in that transition year to apply to graduate schools. And I'll be honest with you, I applied to maybe five, right? We're going through the college application (laughs) process all over again. You think I would have like learned and did better. I think I did a little bit better the second time around, but I applied to maybe five schools, applied to some on the East Coast, um, Loyola and Chicago, and then CSU, 
Colorado State University. I applied here because I had heard that it was a really good program for student affairs in higher ed. Um, but my first choice was Loyola because I wanted to get as close to, back to the East Coast as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I had never visited any of these schools, which now I'm like, everyone should, if they can, visit the school before they go there, right? Good advice. Okay. Right there, yeah. circle that, underline that. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. even if it sounds great on the website, on paper, you don't actually know if you're going to find community and fit in there and like feel like it's home until you're on the campus. And I get that's not a possibility for people who are, you know, right, tickets are expensive to fly places, but if you can, I think it's crucial and it makes it much smoother of a process. And I mean, I'm like an example of that because I thought Loyola was my top school because the website and what I'd heard. Yeah. Um, I, I got an interview offer at CSU. I came here for that interview and I fell in love. And I was like, this school that I didn't really know much about, I only applied because people told me it was good, all of a sudden became my number one school because the faculty were so supportive. The other students that were in graduate school and cohorts before me were diverse. I could see myself in them. Um, they were kind and they seemed supportive. And there was opportunities for assistantships here, which paid for you to go to school. And that was a big factor for me. It's like I don't have money to to do this, and I would prefer not to take out more loans if I don't have to. Um, and so I left CSU, and all of a sudden I was like, Loyola. You're like, got knocked down here, and I was like stressing out about getting in um, to CSU. I ended up getting accepted to Loyola, which felt good. I'm like, that's yeah, cool. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't like, the denials never feel good. Um, and then CSU called me like, I write around Valentine's Day, and they offered me an assistantship in housing. And wow. yeah. That's and, awesome. And acceptance to the school, right? And so with housing, which is so, what is so great, is you get work experience because you're working in it. They pay for your rent every month, mm -hmm. and then they for an assistantship, they also pay your fees for grad school, which is a lot of money. I, we still had to pay, or no, sorry, they pay the tuition. We pay for the fees. So it was like $1,000 a semester for mm -hmm. fees, but they're paying like $30,000 of tuition, which yeah. without that, I wouldn't I wouldn't have been able to do it. So um, really, it was my mentors who inspired me to come to grad school, and then CSU offering me such a, a good deal to give me the access to be able to come here yeah. um, and I have no regrets about that at all but I will That's say awesome. I've thought about a PhD you're already on track right <laughs> on uh -huh. Kayla I think you know I took a year off between undergrad and my master's I think I need like two three years <laughs> so I'm like that's a it's a lot right it's a yeah, lot sure, for sure. your emotional mental capacity um, but I know that in this field it's helpful to have I do really love research and I'm still trying to I, the reason I want to jump into it is because I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do with my life okay and I think growing up you know everyone's like what do you want to do when you grow up you hear that question all the time and it puts so much pressure pressure on like you need to have it all figured out and what I've realized is we do not need to have it all figured out yeah. at 25 years old I do not need to have my whole life planned um which I felt that pressure before and I don't anymore I'm like you know, I think the more experience you get and being exposed to different places and the more of an open mind you can have, the more possibilities you get. And that's really how I even got into my master's degree is like keeping an open mind, right, and just exposing myself to different mm -hmm. places. And so I, I have hope and confidence that if I can continue to do what I'm doing now and keep an open mind, that my path will, you know, be more clear for me. Um, because PhDs, doctoral degrees, they cost a lot of money too, and it's a lot of time. Absolutely. So I yeah. think you need to know 110% before you, you know, jump into something like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, you made an important point, and obviously you went through your grad program, you graduated. Uh-huh. Um, I had a 3.8 GPA. Isn't that so much that better than undergrad? That is amazing. I mean, yeah. grades aren't everything, but I was like, I had a, a bone to pick after undergrad, because I graduated with a 2.99 like, GPA, because I, I, you know, it dropped so much when I transferred, yeah. and the GPA cutoff for the master's degree was a 3.0. You needed a 3.0 to apply, so yeah. I was right under that, and I think... My experience with AmeriCorps and other stuff I did in undergrad really helped kind of balance that out because um, I didn't meet that GPA. So, yeah, I had a bone to pick, and I was like, I need to pull good grades because I kind of I wanted to prove myself that, like, yeah. I can do this, right? So let's hopefully, if I get my PhD, that's the same way. There you go. <laughs> I like that. Um, at, when you graduated, where did you think you were going to land as far as a career and a job? Where, where do you think you were headed? Yeah. 
Uh, from undergrad or, or after, graduate after, school? Yeah, after graduate school. Uh, if I'm gonna be completely honest with you, I had. I was I had no idea about the actual like place right so I like I knew that I loved housing I knew that I loved the career center working there uh, I knew what advisors were I didn't like actually ever have good relationships with my advisors in undergrad or oh grad school I did but not in undergrad I didn't meet with them okay um, very much and they weren't super helpful so I didn't even it's funny I'm in this role now and I actually didn't really understand much before I got into it um, I I limited myself geographically because I met my partner while I was in grad school who's in the military so it was oh, more okay. of a it was more of a uh, let me try to stay as close as possible and still try to find something that I love and I'm passionate about and so I growing up I always loved the health field mm-hmm. but never had anyone in the health field didn't really think I was capable enough to go into the health field because all the science and stuff yeah. so when I heard about health professions advising I was like oh this is super cool because I get to kind of like be on the forefront of health careers without actually being in it. Um, and so that's really why I applied here and what led me to this job. But I think I've always been kind of open-minded. Like I just love people. I love community. I love being able to be like a resource and a support system the same way that people were for me. And I think you can do that in so many different roles. Absolutely. Yeah, so it wasn't so much about the role for me. It was about my ability to be able to like work with students um, and the impact that I'd be able to make through that, yeah. which really, yeah, led me here. And here you are, Thank working you. at Colorado State, U- State University as our health professions advisor. Uh-huh. So that's amazing. Congratulations yeah. to Thanks. you and everything that you accomplished so far. Yeah, it's been about eight, eight nine months. I feel eight, like time yeah. is just flying. It is. It flies <laughs> by so fast. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about this event conference that you're about to be a guest speaker uh, for. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Yeah. This is how I heard about your name. <laughs> and then I, when I saw your name, I'm like, I know her. Uh-huh. I know her. I'm like, and that's why I was like, I didn't know you were a trio. All the pieces of the puzzle came yeah. together. Uh, yeah, so there is a conference at Colorado State University going on, oh, in April, early April. I don't know the exact date off the top of my head, actually. Um, but it's a trio conference for, like, graduate school uh, preparation. And so... You know, and this actually would have been great when I was an undergrad to have this, mm-hmm. because just because you do the application once doesn't mean that doing it again is you know going to be a ton easier. So pretty much what they're doing that day is providing resources on like exams you might have to take, careers, the application process, all that stuff. My presentation is going to be on entrance exams and preparation to apply to graduate school, which is really nice because. I've been through it, so I get it on a personal level, and also it's what I do for work every day, talking to students about applying to professional schools. So I'm pretty, I'm really excited to be able to take my personal stuff and now my professional life and be able to put that into a presentation for students and hopefully provide some, uh, some of those lessons learned yeah. that I did too. Like here are the mistakes that I made. That let's try not to make these if you don't, you don't have to, right? Right. So I'm really excited just to be a part of that. Um, I reached out to the office that's hosting it, like hey, I saw that this conference is going on. Do you, is there any way I can be involved? And then they said, you know, we have some of these presentations that we are, you know, haven't filled yet for speakers. Do you feel good about any of them? Or, and I was like, this is perfect. So that's how I got there. And I'm just, yeah, with how much Geo has done for me, I want to get back in any shape or way or form possible. Awesome. Um, and now, kind of in the topic of conversation of mm-hmm. Trio, um, February is typically a month also celebrating TRIO programs Mm -hmm. and all the impact they do. Um, And do you still keep in touch with a lot of the TRIO folks that have worked with you? Yeah, that's, so yes and no. (laughs) They, it's funny because there's um, a like Facebook group for- A lot of them do now, right? uh Uh-huh, yeah, I have Facebook groups (laughs) everywhere. There's one specifically for um, the one I was involved with in high school. Mm -hmm. And it's so cool because like I'll like their stuff. They'll like my stuff. Sometimes if I post about Trio, they'll like comment on it. It's just yeah. super encouraging. Yeah. Um, honestly, and this is one of these like mistakes. I feel like learn from me and don't do it yourself. I've struggled a lot in terms of keeping communication with people. Like, and I know it's important to like follow up and to reach out. And I think I get so wrapped up in life 
that I, I'm like, oh, I'll do that next week. I'll do that next week, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden weeks turn into years and you haven't reached out. I also think that we hold a lot of pressure on ourselves to like say the best thing or to have sure. some like great, like, oh, look at this awesome thing that happened that I'm going to share with you, right? And I don't think that's the reality. I know now like the world's being switched. Like I love to hear from students I work with, even if they're like, hey, like, I had a really good break. Like, how are you doing, right? Just to know they're they're thinking about me and that they're willing to share with me. And so um, while I do talk to them on Facebook sometimes, Trio, I know that I need to be better just in overall being able to reach out to people and not holding all this pressure. Like, I have to say the perfect things. Sure. Because that communication is just crucial to keep those relationships and to let people know the impact that you've they've had on you in your life. Absolutely. Any final uh, parting thoughts before we wrap up this podcast from you to the audience Mm -hmm. or to anybody listening? Yeah. Mm, So many, so many things. I think, um, I think that, and this is like going back to pressure, right? I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Um, You know, a lot of the students are in trio being first generation and not having role models and mentors sometimes Mm -hmm. put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be that person for everyone else right we need to be like the perfect role model the perfect mentor um we need to like do everything well to like set the stage for our communities to come after us and our families and all of those things um and one thing i've been thinking a lot about is how we like actually do a disadvantage for ourselves when we hold all that pressure on our own back Mm -hmm. like it makes sense right right because we care and it's amazing that we care And I think that if we kind of, if we still have, like, that motivation um, and perseverance to push through without, like, the guilt and the pressure we put on ourselves, I think it'd be a little bit easier to walk through these experiences without holding that. And I I know our families don't want us to hold that, right? Our families don't want us to feel that pressure and, like, it's all on us to make the change. Um, I think that speaks to who we are generally, right? Um, but that's just one thing I wish I would have done better is stressed out a little bit less. And, you know, I think I'll, we all need to give ourselves more pats on the back more often, Absolutely. you know, and just, you know, be thankful for like the fact that we even got to the point that we are and not feel like, oh, I got to do more. I got to do more. I got to do more. But being thankful, like I got to this point. My family is proud of me. I'm doing well by them. And these are these burdens are not ones that I need to carry alone. Um, yeah, because I think we'll just we live a much healthier, happier life if we can have the mentality. So I guess that's my 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 last thought is don't life is serious, right? But don't make it too serious. Yeah, because everything that's everything right. works out the way that it should. There's a network of alumni, trio alumni that are there to support, and I I strongly believe right that uh, all of us have a small contribution to mentor uh, the upcoming class, mm-hmm. uh, especially those coming from true programs, uh, to just set that example and say, you can do it too. Uh-huh. It's possible. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's why I'm like, we don't brag enough about being a trio. Yeah, we, need, yeah. we need to brag more because yeah. if we don't tell students, they don't know, and maybe they make the assumption that we don't know what that is, and so they don't bring it up. So maybe I'm going to start introducing myself like, hi, my name is Kayla. I am a trio, uh, you know, alum, and what's your, like, do you know what that is, right? Yeah. I don't think yeah. that could hurt. That way we get we get more students to open up and talk to us and learn a little bit more about that. I agree. Well, Kayla, it was so fun having you on the podcast. Um, we are again. I'm very, very humble that you were that you chose to be part of this. So uh, it was kind of a spur so of the moment question, so I appreciate you saying yeah, yes. Of course, thank you so much. I'm so I'm so excited that you asked me, oh, and that yeah. I'm like now I'm like I'm gonna listen to every single episode <laughs> on the podcast. This is so awesome. There's still so much for me to learn from other, you know, right? Other speakers too. Yeah. Um, the learning never stops. So thank you so much for having me. It's and my yeah. pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much, and hopefully I can have you on again on the podcast. Oh, of course, I would awesome. love that so much. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. A huge thanks to Kayla Tejada for being on the Let's Talk Trio podcast. If you'd like to be featured in the Let's Talk Trio podcast, please get a hold of me. You can look for my contact information going through Let's Talk Trio on Facebook. Or you may email me at Juan Rivas, J U A N R I V A S 583 at yahoo.com. Slots are still open for part.
parts of February and March. We'd like to also thank our underwriter, the Council of Opportunity and Education, for promoting and for bringing awareness to the podcast and for continuing their support. This was just such a great episode. Our podcast will not be taking a break. We have uh, plenty of back-to-back episodes going on. Our next episode will be at the Trio Day event in Denver. The podcast would like to recognize our staff, Juan Rivas, the executive producer, Amelia Castaneda as our producer, John Russell as our audio specialist, Scott Kendall and Roderick Chambers are as, as the advisors for Let's Talk Trio. You can donate to Let's Talk Trio through Patreon. We are taking public donations to keep the podcast going. Thank you all very much for listening. We'll see you at the next episode.